All right. Hi, Molly. How are you? Good, good. <laughs> so nice to see you. Nice to see you. And Jules is back because Jules has been off, you know, working hard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> things are calming down now. So you'll see a lot more of me, fortunately or unfortunately, depends on your perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody loves to see you, Jules. I mean, you were, you, were, you were missed last time. We always have people ask, where's Jules? <laughs> yeah. I, I, so sweet. <laughs> I know it always feels weird. It's like, it's like my thing in my week. So when I don't get to do it, I'm like, no, that's like, I feel like there's a gap. <laughs> so Molly, it's so great to have you on. We're going to talk. Uh, I, I know you have, a, you're working on a book and there's a couple, you have a couple books already or at least one other book. Isn't that true? Yeah, I do. I actually have three books Okay. Um, and contribute to a few other books, but my next book is definitely my passion project. Mm -hmm. Do you have visual aids? Do you have the, the other their books by, that you can show us? No, I no. wasn't prepared for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, next time. Yes. So, <laughs> That's but, yeah, fantastic. I'd love to talk about that today. Very, very impressive. I'm, I'm um, very impressed with doing that. I found that if you're on Word, you can actually just talk into your computer and it types for you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it's like, oh, wow, I wish I had that when I was in college. <laughs> I have a hard time talking at technology. It's like yeah, talk at technology, and then I go, you can also I, I'm like I want to go back and edit, and then it's just a whole process. Yeah, you can't and, look at yeah. it. You just have to talk and not look at it, and then you yeah. until you're done. Yeah, <laughs> and then it also you can hit read aloud, and it talks at any voice in any country or any tone you want. So word the word now has the Microsoft voice or the. Or the woman's voice, or <laughs> that's right. Isn't that cool? You can like customize your experience, and you can like have, have any type of voice on there that you want. And, I, and there's there's some crazy ones. I mean, just with the uh, uh, the different apps like Alexa and, and stuff, you can put in put like Leslie Nielsen and and some, <laughs> you know some crazy voices. You know, or, or you your, heard or you can also do your own voice. I think I don't know where I heard that. Oh, um, nobody wants to hear their own voice. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they're out there. <laughs> Good morning, Molly. It's time to <laughs> <laughs> their own voice, they cater for that too. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's just crazy. I was just sharing this last night with some of the um, older population I was hanging out with last night. And I was like, it, the technology is just moving a zillion and a half miles an hour. And as an entrepreneur, I have to tell you, even personally here, I was trying to get into a couple of my websites yesterday and they weren't up again. And I'm like, what is going on? You know, so, you know, it's, it's you know, it's just getting used to technology changes and the fastness, but writing books are really cool. Um, but there are a lot of us who like to listen to books. So Molly, yeah. it'd be cool to, I was curious if you, have you done the audio books yet or do you mainly have the books in written form? I did audio book from my very first book back in 2009 when nobody listened to audio books. And uh, yes, I'm an audible for sure. So I'm definitely, and I love that you said that because I was trying to write my book on, you know, type it out and I just could not do it. I was so frustrated until I remembered the word feature and now I'm just speaking it. And I truly put a piece of paper over my computer so I can't see the words. Otherwise I'll stop and edit it and what have you. So uh, that process has been working really well for me. Yeah. I, I gave it a shot. Um, and I wrote out like 14 pages in like, uh, I don't know, half an hour. And then I was like, Oh my gosh, I have a big mouth. <laughs> must yeah. have a lot of my mind, but it really, it really surprised me. Cause then I was like, um, Okay, now that's too much material because now I have to edit it, and that's yeah. not fun. Yeah, right? well, I have an Daniel editor, Jordan. thankfully. Hi, Daniel. Daniel's Welcome. here. Oh, hey, Daniel. Nice to know. He's one of our local 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 yeah, we're getting. <laughs> and he's very interactive too. So I, I, I hope he's just as interactive today as he normally is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Where's Daniel from? You're in Arizona, right, Daniel? Hey, Howard. 
Yeah, I think I, th I think I remember Daniel's out of Arizona. Yeah, I think. Yeah, someplace hot. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was just in Arizona like uh, two, I think two weeks ago. It was just beautiful down there, and uh, we spent. Oh, he's a Boston native now. Now in Phoenix, yes, it's hot. <laughs> so I was there two weeks ago, and it was not. It was beautiful. I, I enjoyed it and did some hiking and went up to Sedona. It was it was great. Oh, 90 degrees is cool for for phoenix isn't it daniel right <laughs> uh, i yeah i'm kind of like not looking forward to going back to colorado right now because it uh do you guys still have snow up there nah. in, the mountains. <laughs> in the mountains yeah but it is windy it's crazy yeah, past couple days crazy. i know yeah. Yeah. i don't definitely don't miss that I, I was flying back from the southeast a few days ago and the turbulence was so wild I guess there was like a tornado warning that we didn't know about or like it was <laughs> the winds were so strong and the plane was like going side to side and I'm oh. like texting because you know you get the free messaging on the planes now I'm, like texting my mom I'm, like I think this plane's gonna fall out of the sky <laughs> so if it does love you like I'm freaking out and everyone was so calm everyone's sitting there like yeah nothing nothing to see yeah. I'm like holding on for dear life yeah, yeah. everywhere's been did really you, well I'm glad you're safe did you hear about the Delta airline where their entire front wind uh windshield of a or a plane shattered oh my gosh what? and they had to Is do an impossible? emergency landing in Denver at yeah I think DIA last week I was on a Delta flight so I'm glad you didn't uh. <laughs> and they and the uh the you, you know the pilot kept saying yes everyone be calm Oh. <laughs> our <windshield is> <laughs> be calm we can't see out our windshield oh, yeah. everybody's freaking out like oh <laughs> yeah all those, all those, those planes nowadays are all robots anyway right yeah they basically fly themselves i don't know why those little weird facts pop up on my phone i just happen to go oh that's interesting yeah i thought i thought i could land the phone the plane with my iphone right <laughs> <laughs> There's an app for that. <laughs> I'm sure there is. There is. A friend oh, gotta, of mine. They make you turn it off. So. <laughs> yeah, a friend yeah. of mine, he's a, a retiree. I'm making a lot of retiree friends around here. But um, he's got this big, massive plane that's like got an eight, eight foot wingspan. He's just like a little, a massive jet. And he's out there like with this little remote control, just like a little kid. <laughs> and, uh, and his wife says, you know what? I don't know where to put this thing because it's taking up the entire guest bedroom. <laughs> All right. Well, we're about a minute to start here. So we'll get going here real soon. I, I know all of the, the planes and, and the, the weather lately has been kind of uh, scary. But I, you know, just to, to your point, Jules, I, I did see a, uh, it was a documentary or something like that was showing how, how planes can flex their wings. I mean, they can almost the the flexibility of those wings they're supposed to be able to handle a hurricane or anything like that um, that's well, reassuring because it, it it definitely didn't feel like that at the time it was like, <laughs> going up and down and then side to side and then it was oh, scary and i i don't like roller coasters i get really nauseous on any kind of like rides like that and that's what it felt like i we were just mm -hmm. going all over the place i'm like oh my god on top of wow. it go up everywhere <laughs> But we, we made we made it. That's the main thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. All right, we're at the top of the hour here. Oh. Yeah, at the top of the hour, so let's kick things off, Jules. Yes, everyone's here. Okay, beautiful. Hey, Samit. Uh, all right, everyone. Hello and welcome to Hi, another round of the People Strategy Forum. We're excited to have you here today. Um, as you can see, we have a very full panel. So a lot of experience and expertise coming right at you over the next hour. Uh, my name is Jules. I help host this forum. So if you have any questions, I do encourage you to put them into the chat. We love comments. We love feedback. We love questions. We'll try to get as much of your questions answered today. But if you're coming to us outside of Zoom, maybe you're watching on LinkedIn or YouTube, uh, still write those comments in anyway, because we always make sure we go back in and answer everyone's questions at the end. 
And for those who have never been to a People's Strategy Forum, you're like, I just signed up for this thing. I don't know what's going on. What do you guys do here? Uh, our goal really is to engage and energize and elevate your employees and your company. So what we do, we get together every week. We bring a different guest speaker and we keep everything really conversational whilst we cover a range of different topics. Uh, and we, we try to just answer all your questions, give you as much information, really uh, uplift you and, and get you on your way to uh, into your day. So uh, I'm going to introduce everyone else here that helps me along the way. We have Shah. Now Shah is uh, an, a former HR professional living in Mexico, living the good life there. Uh, she went from being in HR to being an entrepreneur and starting her own companies. And she is currently the founder of Mountain and Sea Health Advocacy and Mountain and Sea Career Coaching. So she coaches expats and she was sharing some fun stories about that just before. Uh, we also have Sumit, who is a, a experienced HR consultant, talent management professional. He helps organizations of various sizes uh, implement new and improved HR practices. Uh, we also have Howard, and Howard is at, works alongside the team at Comp Team. He's an experienced compensation advisor with over 30 years of experience. He's worked with some of the, the biggest organizations, JP Morgan, uh, Citibank, Barclays. And so it's always good to have all of these guys here with all their expertise and their personalities and their energy. And uh, the last person I'm going to introduce is our speaker for today. So we have Molly McGrath. We're very excited to have her here. She is the founder of Hiring and Empowering Solutions, and she's coached, she has consulted, and she's staffed over uh, 4,000 law firms over the span of 26 years. So very busy lady, a lot of experience, and her areas of expertise are employee engagement and executive level leadership, just to name a few. Not only does she have her own company, but she has a podcast named The Hire and Empower Podcast. So you can check that out after you uh, are done watching. Don't, don't log out just yet. <laughs> and uh, she is also uh, an author, an Amazon bestselling author. She's written a couple of books and she was just sharing how she is writing her next book. And she was sharing that process with us as well. Uh, so we're just very excited to talk about fixing your employees or fix your employer. So welcome Molly to the People Strategy Forum. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So, so Molly, I know, I mean, I'm excited to hear that you're writing this new book and, and I know that's part of the topic of, of what we're going to discuss today, but before we get there, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I mean, what, what drove you to do what you're, what you do today and helping the companies that you help? Yeah, great question. So I started out in 97 um, in the legal space. I fell into it, uh, moved from Buffalo, New York to Denver, Colorado. And back then you would apply for a job in the classified ads in the paper. And um, very first job I applied for, went in for an interview and took it as becoming a project manager. And it was for a national organization for estate planning and elder law attorneys. Very, very niche specific. I knew nothing about attorneys. Thankfully, I'd never interacted with an attorney by that time at the tender age of 27. And I, um, my first order was to go to a conference or about 2000 um, law firm owners across the country. We went to Atlanta and um, shell shock you had thrown right into the frying pan. And it was interesting because I'd go to the cocktail receptions, go to the breaks in between the breakout sessions, et cetera breakfast table, dinner table. And my job was to interact with the clients. And I would sit down next to an attorney, a business owner. And um, the common theme I would hear by the end of five days at this conference is business would be great, but for my employees, you can't find good people. You can't keep good people, been there, done that. And just constant, constant griping about the employees. Well, this conference, they would bring their employees as well, which is fantastic. Kudos to immersing your um, employees into personal and professional development. You know, back in 97, when coaching was not even a street term, many people didn't know much about it. And so I'd go to the other side of the table, talk to the employees, and they would say, you know, everything would be great, but for my boss who gives me zero time, zero attention, zero feedback, they're a control freak, they won't give us anything to work on, and we see all the problems, and we just wish 
and fill in the blank. I'm like, there is a massive disconnect here. And um, from that, I went back to my new boss and said, you know, he's like, how's the conference? What'd you think? What's your takeaways? And I'm like, I don't know anything about this industry, but this is what I'm hearing. This is what I'm seeing. And um, right then and there, we started a coaching program for attorneys and their support team. And um, the rest is history, as they say. That's great. I mean, yeah, it's, it's amazing when those, uh, when you see, I mean, I think it's not just in the legal firm or legal uh, industry, but everywhere else. I mean, it's, it's the, the common rub. I mean, employees, finding good people, uh, managers and how to manage them and so forth. But I know when you're, when you're, when you're looking at uh, the title of your book, Fix Your Employee Employer, I mean, what, what drove you to that topic in, uh, in this current day and age? Well, you know what, it, it's been something I've been hearing for over 20 years. I do, I have two sides of my practice. One is uh, recruiting and staffing and the other side of it is coaching and consulting. And I would hear this all the time. People that will call me for recruiting, they'll say, especially now in an employee driven market with the unemployment in the legal space in particular, the unemployment rate is 0.9% it's staggering. And so I've never been busier than we have been in the history of our business. And time after time, after time, again, I get phone calls that would say, um, whether they're firing someone, replacing someone because they left and they didn't do what it took to retain their employee and give them that proper time, attention and feedback, or they're growing and they're trying to add to their workforce. They'll call me and consistently say, listen, I need you to find me someone, but they better come with batteries included because I don't have time to train them. I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know, that was the common theme. If they're firing someone, they would say, I need you to find me good people and I need you to fix my employees. Common theme I do over and over and over again. I ran surveys, I ran focus group, and that's what I would hear from employees all the time or employers. On the flip side, because I do have... Um, a team empowerment academy only for staff. And um, I have a coaching program for them. And constantly I would hear from them uh, about the other side of the table, like I experienced 20 some years ago of, you know, it's not us, it's them. And so nobody's speaking the same language. They both want the same thing, identical goals. When you strip away the peel away the layers of the onion, you figure out what they want is to make a difference. They want to absolutely give outstanding customer service or client services, and they want to make, be, feel in full control of their calendar, of their work that they have on their desk. They want to be able to plan their work and work their plan. And, and that's what the employers wanted out of the employees. They both wanted the same thing, but they were not speaking the same language at all. And they were not taking what I call the power of the pause and really spending time together at the end of the day it was just a breakdown in communication and giving themselves the grace and space of time to actually get on the same playing field. Yeah, we love we love hearing that because that's the and we believe that the, the future of this field is is all in relationships, relationships between our peers between our, our managers and employees and, and other types of work, the workforce. I mean, whether they're gig workers or contractors or anything else. So gl glad to hear you say that. So yeah, the, the uh, but one, one thing is you mentioned is that um, people want to make a difference. They want to do something that they, they believe in, you know, but and when you're out there, there's legal firms have to differentiate themselves. Right. And then, but the other thing is, you know, other other industries too. It's like, what if you sell janitorial supplies and or your or other things like that? How do, how do you you know create craft this message or or how do you coach your leaders in create creating a message that can that uh, talks to their candidates? You know, it's interesting because I um, I do recruiting, so these business owners will give me these job descriptions and I'll rip them up and throw them in the garbage. And I'll say in this day and age, when you're looking to hire or you're looking to retain your employees, to your point, the employees always 
thought of it as a relationship. They just didn't have the language or their context for it. But now since the pandemic, when we were all forced to sit on our couch and take stock of our entire life, well, where do you spend the majority of your time and energy and where even when you're not at work, you're thinking about work, you're thinking about what's coming at you tomorrow, you're thinking about what you didn't get done today, the potholes that that you know, that need to be fixed, we spend 80% of our time in work, whether it's physically there or mentally there, energetically there. And so the employees always thought of it as a relationship. So I rip up these job descriptions and rewrite them from a place of painting the picture of what it's going to look like and feel like on a daily basis. You know, I basically think of it like a match.com portfolio or profile or what have you. That's how you have to write it because you have to attract people. And my number one subject line to get people to talk to me as a recruiter, my first message that we send out is, are you happy? Are you being treated well? And do you feel valued? If not, let's talk. And it excites me so much more for the replies that I get from people that say, I'm happy and I love where I work versus the people that say, let's talk. I'll go as far as find out where they're working and try to find a message that I could t- send to somebody in HR or the organization say, I don't know what you're doing, but keep doing it. And in fact, 10 exit, because your people won't even talk to a recruiter right now. Yeah. You're doing an extraordinary job. Keep it up. And I love when I get feedback from that. Most recruiters won't go that far, but it delights me. And sadly, I don't get that response that much since COVID. In fact, I'm getting more people that are saying, let's talk. And I'm deeply curious about my number one question is, why are you talking to a recruiter today? Well, I'm just exploring. No, no, no. Tell me why, what's not working? Why are you talking to me? And and that fascinates me, that conversation to figure out. And at the end of the day, people will say, there's no room for growth. There's no opportunities. I'm like, what's your definition of growth? What's your definition of opportunity? When I keep peeling it back and peeling it back and peeling it back, it really truly is this simple. Their employers are not giving them time, attention, and feedback and not stepping up to be leaders, leading leaders. And it's so simple that you're hiring human beings versus human doings first and foremost, and employers, business owners, all of us need to really take a deep dive at that and take that very, very seriously. It's no longer a transaction. You're lucky to get a paycheck. You're lucky to have a job that, that it, and we're never going back to that from my perspective. Well, I have to just say, Molly, bravo. (laughs) Bravo. I, I just give hats off to you. I think that that is super fantastic. And, you know, as a former HR, I mean, I am still an HR person for my own <laughs> companies, but, um, but w- I just remember that we were always talking about when to do um, um, the, the exit interview. And if you remember the exit interviews, and then it turned into, we need to do the stay interview now. And it was because our employees were choosing to leave a year to six months prior to anybody having any clue that they were thinking of leaving. And even your top engaged employees and your superstars were happily out there looking. They were the smart ones with, uh, you know, their LinkedIn profile up to date and talking to future employers. So bravo, I just want to give hats off to you. I think that you bring up some fabulous points. Mm, I love that a state interview. I never heard of that, but you haven't. Wow. Yeah, no, but I, I love that. I just did a presentation for the Chicago Bar Association on, um, you know, why the employee review must die. And you really yes. need to transform it into an employee growth plan mm-hmm. and doing them on a quarterly basis. And we all don't get don't get too comfortable and think, oh, I have great people. I hired someone who okay, now I'm done. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I have this position place. No, you have to work even harder to retain your people. And I don't want to breathe fear in the room, yeah. but from my perspective, 
every single day, you have to think that, you know, at any given day, you could walk in and have a resignation sitting on your table. So, you know, woulda, shoulda, coulda, no more. You have to be actively engaged and take your leadership and your ownership of your leadership very, very seriously when it comes from a place of retention, because honestly, none of us are safe, so to speak, if we're not intentional about the culture and the energy and the essence in the relationship of every single person that we have the honor to employ and to grow up and to pour into and to build. That's the number one job duty that so many entrepreneurs miss. Yeah, we called it a, when I worked in a healthcare system, we took our 22% turnover of our nursing staff in an entire region and was able to take that down to 8%, which in nursing is phenomenal. Oh my goodness. Uh, And so Mm -hmm. we created what's called a retention toolkit. And um, it had many, many tools such as the stay interview. Um, So yeah, that's why you give me chills when you're talking because that's exactly what I was talking about when the, when I had executives get frustrated with me. Um, <laughs> I was like, I just don't understand why you just don't get this because we really shouldn't have a 22% turnover of our nursing staff. And since I've left healthcare formally, uh, the formal side of healthcare, and I, I still do health advocacy, but um, I just can't imagine what the turnover is right now. I mean, I haven't really looked at the data right now in healthcare, but it's gotta be unreal. Yeah. Has it gotten more challenging? You know, this dynamic's been going on for years and years, and it's, it's the same story. But I imagine it's gotten even harder now with people working from home due to COVID and trying to reach out and, you know, make sure people are engaged and happy. What are you recommending to companies now in this environment where so many people are just, you know, working from home and not in the office? Yeah. It- you know, I, in my perspective, I think it, they're more engaged than ever of being in the office. Um, the firms that I work with, the companies I work with, I highly recommend doing a daily huddle every morning um, mm-hmm. where they all get do, treated as a military stand-up meeting. And it's worked amazing in regards to keeping connection and collaboration and um accountability. We're human beings. We love accountability. And if you can embrace it and name it and have your top three for the day, what's, you know, what's going to stop you, where are you going to jammed up and you treat it truly like a coaching session versus a micromanagement session. You keep it, treat it as a place for collaboration and leadership. It, it works wonderfully. I really have heard from people over and over again, even the ones that want remote work or hybrid um, model uh, because they've been home there. They're, I hear from people over and over again, I am getting more done than I ever did in the office. You know, I walk in the office before it is 22 minutes before I even can make it to my desk to hear about somebody's watching the bachelor last night. <laughs> like it's just totally um, productive. And so, or I won't come out of my office at all because I'm afraid I'm going to get hijacked and taken off my projects or what have you. And now people have that flexibility. They have that freedom. And I know I run the firms that I service a fractional CEO for. Um, I run reporting every single week. I lead their weekly team meetings and their numbers are off the charts since they're remote. What about the social interaction? This, oh gosh, with Teams and Slack and all that that they're doing right now. I mean, they're having more fun with sending these memes and all the things that you see on social media, you know, with if it's something as simple as a Will Smith slap. I mean, just going back and forth with that and finding all the different memes that are with it. You have no idea. Well, you may, but just the connection that that creates of having fun with technology. I think we, Shar was talking about technology earlier and it, it's just it has brought so much community other people do happy hours in zoom rooms or what have you or if they are employees that are um, all in the same town many people are doing retreats I have a firm right now I've been watching them on social media they're all in France together so it's people that didn't take the time to do 
quarterly strategic planning retreats, quarterly team building retreats, et cetera. Now that it's safe to travel, people are doing that as well, which is fantastic. I have a firm that's getting ready to go on a cruise. I mean, the, the, you ha- you're, they're getting more creative than ever and doing that once a quarter versus doing a monthly bowling outing or doing a birthday cake in the break room for 30 minutes in between meetings is my opinion, much more, it's just rich. Yeah, great. Sam, you're on mute. Sam, you're muted. Oh, you're muted. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> All right, so, so can everybody hear me now, Son? Yes. Good. So the, the uh, uh, and other thing is, I know that you're, you specialize a lot in the, the legal industry and so forth. Is the, are what employees looking for in that industry different than others? I mean, is there any, or what are your thoughts there? No, it, there, it's no different at all, which is fascinating because, um, you know, these are words that attorneys have told me in law school, they're trained to be skeptics. They're trained skeptics to believe nothing, to trust nothing. The legal industry is in in big trouble right now because they're so accustomed to a brick and mortar model. And they're really, really struggling with this hybrid and or remote model. And they're digging their heels in fast and they will not um they will not flex. And um, they just don't know how to make the shift into technology, make the shift into um, not all, but many by and large are. It's one of the industries that's really struggling right now with staffing. And so employees are sadly um, leaving the industry and going to hang their own shingle, be an independent contract for a paralegal, or be a contract attorney and just take on certain different jobs or independent marketing coordinator, or social media coordinator, if you were in-house or what have you. So I, I, again, you know, I think when we were all forced to the power of the pause and sit on our couch, we really took stock. I, not many people I talked to were sitting around binging, watching Netflix. You know, they were really immersing themselves into webinars, into online courses, into podcasts, into shows such as this. And really, it was expanding their horizon and expanding their thinking. So I think it's employees across. I'm in many masterminds with different professions and different. I'm a lifetime learner. I try to be involved in anything that I can. And the conversation's the same. You know, people want a two-sided relationship at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. So they want, they, they want to have that relationship connection at work. Uh, they want to have more autonomy and choice. That's what I'm hearing overall. What, what about those other, you know, we're looking at, you know, industries that can have more flexibility, but sometimes, you know, we're, we're in a situation where we, there's some, some of those jobs where we just require them to be on site, such as in the construction industry, something like that. Uh, is, is there, things that employers can do to, to be more flexible and offer flexibility when for those jobs that require presence? Yeah, I, I think it can. I mean, again, it's I, I like to take the pressure off the business owner that's not up to you to create it and just sit down and sit down with your team, sit down with your employee, your supervisors, your manager, what have you, and survey your employees and see what they want. It's all, I, in my experience, it's always so much simpler than what we make up in our head that we think that they want. Everybody goes to money or even now they're like remote, remote, remote. I'm like, it's not an either or it's an, and so figure out what it is that they want. They can, you know, everybody come together. It's fine. If you're going to take off on Fridays or what have you, or maybe just as long as we have coverage, let's make Mm -hmm. certain that we all can have this flexibility and have this flow and ease with it that emulates collaboration versus, you know, my way or the highway. Right. I, I love that. I mean, the, the fact that you, it's, it's something as simple as just asking, <laughs> you know, it's like, what do you guys want? What would you like? I, I know that uh, here at Compton, we do have a process that's called the workforce experience scorecard where we, we go out and we evaluate. I, I know Howard and Sumit have been on a project, a couple of projects like that, and how we're, we're asking about, you know, simply, you know, what do you, what do you think of, of the rewards that we provide? What do you think of, 
of the, the types of education that are, or development plans that we have available for you, our opportunities, uh, career pathing, stuff like that. So it's, it's amazing. Every company has something different that they want. It's not one size fits all. Everybody has mm -hmm. a, a different piece there. But uh, how are those process, uh, Smith and Howard, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on uh, unique experience on the, the workforce experience scorecard and, and talking to people. Uh, you know, has there any, been any revelations for you and, and as far as going through that process and understanding what, what people are looking for in their career? What do you think, Smith? I think, yeah, it's been an interesting uh, journey, Sam. Um, and one of the disconnects I regularly see is uh, how management feels they've uh, created just the right set of benefits and the right set of uh, rewards for people. And when people say we don't really agree, it comes as a surprise. So uh, it sounds like a lot of uh, design around the workforce experience happens in closed doors, uh, in conference rooms with uh, people who, who wouldn't really know whether um, dental insurance matters more to a person uh, than uh, let's say a gym membership or vice versa. So we, we tend to believe uh, that I think um, if I were in that situation, I would value a gym membership a lot more than anything else, but I'm not in that situation, right? So that's, uh, that's one of the disconnects I see. Second is I think um, we place too little value on culture uh, and there is solid research which says that culture has a monetary value. People would happily take uh, a lower salary if they can work for the right culture. And that's probably a feeling that's been uh, strengthened more in the last two years as well. And the, other, the other thing is, you know, sometimes you hear companies saying, well, we have all these programs and, you know, I don't know why people are complaining. And there's, you know, you can have a full lineup of offerings but if you don't communicate the value to the employees and, and that needs to be done on a regular ongoing basis it, it just can't be like oh well we have this and people just aren't you know taking advantage of it people may not know about it they need to be educated there needs to be that back and forth communication between managers and employees so you just can't just throw it out there and say well we have these programs mm. Yeah, I, I hear that all the time, or people will say that they, they have all these programs or all these videos or processes and manuals and what have you, and they identify that as culture, mm -hmm. or they want to hire someone and then throw them in front of a computer, or stick them in a room to watch and digest all these programs and all this information, but there's no dialogue. Mm -hmm. There's no give or take. Okay, great. Here's what I want you to take away from it. This is how it's going to support you personally, professionally, skill set, knowledge, etc. And then let's have a debrief after. Let's have a conversation. Here's what I want you to pay attention to. I'd love for you to tell me what else you see from it. And they don't, they put it on a shelf and then, you know, often use it as a weapon for why people aren't working because they didn't watch the videos or they didn't do the program or they didn't read the 4,000 page manual and digest it and be able to teach, show, do, go, grow. And, and they're not taking responsibility for your job as a trainer, as a leader, as a manager, as a business owner is again, the coaching and the communication and the collaboration with these programs. So I think also more needs to be done with, you know, training managers. A lot of times people are being promoted because they're excel at their roles and we say, oh, you know, we're going to move you up to a manager and same thing. Oh, watch these videos, read, read these, you know, releases. And, and it, you know, it, it takes more than that to be a manager. And you really need to understand the, the needs of your people. And they need to constantly reaching out to them and leading them. And, and I think we failed in a lot of cases and in terms of not providing that training and education to people assuming the manager role. Yeah, I agree because the training that many of us got is outdated. Extremely. Well, as a, I was at um, my former position with one of the big health systems, I, I was the regional director of talent management strategy and organizational effect, effectiveness, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I had uh, one of the most fascinating job descriptions I think you'd ever see. Um, but I think it was really uh, frustrating for me because 
the organization was so siloed and um, every single department had it, had its own project manager, for example. Um, it was it was really challenging to, to try to align talent management strategy. So as a talent management strategist, I just kept creating more and more talent management strategies. So I eventually, I always talk about my eight page, eight, eight size font talent management strategy. It just was never good enough, you know? Um, I just, it was really, I, and I know a lot of my colleagues in HR feel very frustrated because there's a lack of buy-in of, we all are talent management strategists. Every single leader in this organization owns HR and talent management strategy. And I, I hate to let you know that leader, but it is also your job to create those meaningful relationships with each and every one of your employees and break down the silos with the other, the other departments and the other executives in the company so that your employees don't feel the negative impact and really um, are feeling crushed about working in the culture. Um, but to get the executive buy-in for some of us HR colleagues is so frustrating. I felt um, the weight of the world. I felt like I I had it fix world hunger. I mean, every day I felt like it was only my job to fix world hunger in the talent management strategy. And it was really difficult. And I know that a lot of my colleagues, hey, all of my colleagues out there, we know what you're talking about. So Molly, what you're saying is music to our ears. It's, um, I guess my question for you is how do we get the executive buy-in? So it sounds like you were very um, successful at your credibility and getting that buy-in from your attorney groups. So what was your strategy to, to um, convince them what that meant? Yeah, you know, I as I tell my clients all the time that I learned from one of my mentors early on, it's it's never for a lack of strategy. And that is always where entrepreneurs, business owners, leaders want to go when they when something's not working, when it's not broken lack of a strategic plan, lack of strategy, lack of system, lack of process, and it's hiding out. You know, it starts with you. So it really has to take stock of where you are investing in your people. So that's always my first question. What's a common denominator? Is a common denominator that's hard to get people to come to work? Whether it's a brick and mortar or people don't want to work anymore, I, I, I none of my experience at all. So what type of culture, especially when I'm doing recruiting, I had a firm here in Colorado yesterday, they had three different people that turned down offers in a row, you know, for more, the, the, the feedback from the candidates was more money, more what have you. But when I really had to shine the flashlight on how they showed up in the Zoom interview with their click clipboard and treating it very clinical, and what are you going to do for me? And how are you, how am I going to get an ROI? I'm paying you this amount of money. People don't want to engage with that anymore. And quite honestly, they don't have to really good, talented people do not have to, I, nobody has to. And so when it comes to getting them to over, I don't care about the strategy. The strategy is the last piece of how to get there. And that's always the first place that people will go to when it comes time for figuring out what's going wrong when things are going sideways. And when we're ha keep bed butting up against the same problem, whether it be process, well, we have 14 manuals sitting on the bookshelf of the how to. So the problem is not the how to. The problem is how we're communicating the how to go back to Howard, what he said, they're not communicating the value of it. And people will not, people need to know the beginning, the middle, and the end, right? That's strategy. That's a plan. But no, they need to know the beginning, the middle, and the end after they know the why. They'll get behind it. They will do that, but they need to know the why of what they're doing so they could use their own critical thinking. They can make suggestions for improvement. They could add their own personality on it so they can feel like a valued member. Number one, they can feel like they're a contributor. Number two, and then they can consistently be giving, creating that value by how can we leverage this? How can we optimize this? How can we make this better? And if you don't know the why, 
what's in it for me is a buzzword that people use in the business world, you know, but it's, it's, it's more than that. It's deeper than that. It's not just about me. It's about you as a company. How do I know if I'm hitting it out of the park or how do I know that I'm failing miserably? What are the ground rules? So I, I think I can understand that connection as far as, you know, those, those businesses out there, they, they say, okay, well, I hear you. I, we, we can define our why, but every company has a culture, right? And, 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 but leaders, sometimes they sit back and say, well, what is our culture? How do we articulate that? So as, as being responsible for, for finding good people and bringing in to, into these organizations, how do you, when somebody asks you, Molly, it's like, what is the, okay, well, what's the culture like there? How do you answer that? Yeah, you know, I always have them paint the picture of what it looks like and it feels like on a day to day basis. So treat it like you're taking somebody on a home tour for buying a home and walk them through the kitchen, walk them through the living room, walk them through because for people figuring out what your day to day world's going to look like so often people will do these business strategy sessions nail down their culture, they'll find their, their core values, what have you, they'll run to TJ Maxx home goods, find these words on the shelf, and then put them all over their office in their conference room and point to them. And which is fantastic and great to have something to anchor to. But what does it mean for me? What can I expect with my interaction with you? So when I'm talking to candidates, I will paint that picture of what the culture looks like and feels like on a daily ba basis. So who can you expect? You know, you have partner number one, that is a woman or man of very few words. They show up like a tornado every single day. Their intentions are well, this is how they communicate. This is what they expect. This is how you speak to them, how they'd like to give and receive information. How do you like to give and receive information? And I basically paint the picture of all the players on the field and what have you, and why everybody is so unique with it and why their, their strong suit is their strong suit. So if one person's intense and they're a screamer, or what have you, we need that. We need mm -hmm. that piece of it for these parts of the process. And this is where you're going to interact with them on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is how you're going to be able to shine in your communication, your interaction with them in this part of your job description to set you up for success. And so I really paint that in the beginning. I don't sugarcoat it at all. And there are people that are like, oh my God, I love that. I thrive in that environment that it gets my juices going. That's phenomenal. I want to be with that guy or other people that are saying, I'm like, well, you're that's 10% of your interaction. And so I really paint the picture. There's other ones where I'm like, everybody is like a Sunday walk in a the park. There's very calm, very, it's not a good fit for me. So I really paint the picture of the personalities, the persona, the day-to-day -day interaction and who the players are. And through my recruiting process, I do assessment um, as well to figure out how people like to give and receive information, their communication style. Cause in my opinion, that's the part that where we see the breakdown. Hmm. I love your, your, your approach. Like you're, you're saying as a envision as, as like a home walkthrough, but, but imagine, I mean, sometimes there's those like the, the, the bathroom needs remodeling, right? And it looks terrible. I mean, uh, so what's, uh, when we're, we're bringing this up with candidates, I mean, should we, should we kind of throw out our dirty laundry there and let them know yes. the weaknesses too? I do all the time when I have like, right now I'm hiring a significant amount of CEOs for some of these law firms that experience growth and people that are qualified and have the experience. I absolutely do in the beginning. I'll say, let me tell you right now, the um, entrepreneur is running around with a like a whirling dervish. He has absolutely no time. He is coming into this interview hot. He is going to come at you full blown. I've given him permission to, I'll be in there as well, but I'm telling you right now, here are the top things. Employees haven't had reviews ever. There's a lack of a review process right now. The CRM is a disaster. We can't even generate weekly reports to figure out what the KPIs are right now. And, you know, right now the boss has his wife working in the business and he wants her out and he can't be the one to fire her and she doesn't want to be there anymore. So you got to gently creatively figure out a way to get her out of there in 90 days. Cause she's driving everyone crazy. They're like, yep. 
that's, ex- I, I've done it all before and I know exactly how to do it. So yeah, I do. I tell them that right up front. I tell them the energy that the entrepreneur is going to bring to the interview or the HR person or what have you, they're going to be coming in on fumes. They're stressed out. They have no time in their calendar to even go to the bathroom and your jobs to protect their calendar and protect their confidence and protect them from employees. <laughs> I just, I think you might notice Sam and I just giggling and laughing because, uh, uh, absolutely 100%. That is exactly the truth. Uh, and I think the honesty, the transparency, the authenticity of the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, I mean, yes, I love your idea, like going through a, a home walkthrough, even if it's a virtual home walkthrough, I think that's fantastic. Uh, and then just literally talking about some of the dynamics the person's going to have to adapt to. Yeah, you um, have to. And I also think it's important that you give the hiring company that same candid feedback about their culture too, uh, as far as why it might be more difficult to to acquire that fancy candidate that they're wanting to lowball them on their compensation. I think uh, Sam and <sighs> Howard understand that, um, but yet they want the this high end superstar um, and then have no flexibility. So. I, I, I'm just like sitting here thinking of all those, those moments of trying to hire CEOs and, and, and trying to, to, you know, show them a, a, a situation that they're walking into that wasn't necessarily what they expected and then wondering why they were leaving six months later. So I think that's, that's perfect. I know. I love that you say that. You know, one thing I always tell when I facilitate these Zoom interviews with the hiring manager or the business owner is that you're responsible for the energy you leave in the room and people are going to match your energy. So, so often I'll facilitate these interviews, 30 minute quick meet and greet Zoom interviews. And after the attorney's like, eh, they're not, they're not a good fit. Really? Okay. Tell me why. And they go through it. And I'll say, I want you to go back and watch this video because I recorded this and see how the candidate matched your energy. You didn't smile once. You did not take your head out of your clipboard and take in feverish notes. You never greeted them with warm and welcome. You never got into the essence and energy of what they're going to experience working for you. Right now, hiring and retention is 100% sales. I, I um, was doing an interview process for chief HR officer position, and I went through all those hoops and assessments and, you know, aced every single thing. I, I mean, not to brag, but I did really well. <laughs> and I was the final of like three candidates. And I was sitting in the final executive panel interview, you know, where all the chief financial officer and all of them were in. And the CEO, you know, dressed in her magnificent you know, uh, probably $5,000 suit, you know, scrolls in 25 minutes late and just had this snarky look on her face. And she wanted to tear my, my resume apart because um, I had a couple gaps of my employment because I had been an entrepreneur and I was taking care of my ill mother for, uh, uh, for like six months at one point in my life. And, um, and I got such an icky feeling of that particular major health system. Um, I walked out and went to my car after this grueling process. And I thought, I never want to work for that healthcare system. And not only that, I was a candidate and I, I, I can't tell you how many people, I'm not going to say what health organization this is, but, and what, what hospital it is, but um, it's like, I wouldn't go there as a patient. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, it's not only that, I mean, you're really spreading a real negative reputation about that organization when you treat your candidates like dirt. Yeah. And, and then it takes what you get no, you know, feedback or response of why you you didn't get the job either. Right. No kidding. I I had a situation just, I had a situation just like that, Char. I mean, but on the consulting side, you know, it's like, we, um, you know, I was uh, looking at or, or talking to a potential um, uh, client that we would be working with and uh, everything was great. Then then the CEO came in the room and the energy 
was just horrible. And it's, it's just in how they show up. And so it's, I think that's, that's a real good call out that Molly mentioned as, as leaders. I mean, we need to be conscious and how we show up in yeah. these situations or you can derail, lose some of the best candidates out there. Right. Uh, I think I recently heard of a particular sports team and I'm not going to say which sports team it is where that particular candidate uh, filed a complaint about one of the interviewees and it happens to be somewhere close to where you all are. So I'm not gonna say what team it is, but um, it can get sticky and turn into a litigation as well, just to, just to say. So Molly, I would love to hear your perspective on, I mean, as, as we, one of the big things that, that um, employ or hiring managers have to think about and so forth is the balance between you know competency and experience and behaviors right and so what's your impression on that i mean what is there one that that is more important than the other or is there i mean what's your thoughts i get that question all the time you know especially when i'm presenting resumes so to speak and i'll get a response of no i don't even want to talk to them they don't have the blah, 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 skill set, knowledge, what have you. Um, I've written about this in my books. I've done on my podcast. I've written blogs about don't get seduced by the resume. Because in my experience, again, you're hiring human beings first and foremost. And you can always train skills. You can always train knowledge, especially in this day and age that there is no shortage of online courses and programs and things of that nature to send people regardless of any industry. You cannot train emotional intelligence and emotional maturity. You cannot train mindset. You cannot train all the human stuff unless you have a full-time psychologist on your staff. And even then it's not a good investment or return on investment. It's a human stuff. It's a people stuff that tend to make employers really gripe about employees business would be great but for the employees and it's because they re interview from skill set and knowledge in my experience versus interviewing from the emotional intelligence emotional maturity and the mindset and the human behaviors and how they think and operate in their perspective of how they view the world very interesting yeah so um jules i know that we are coming up on on the uh, uh the, the last few moments of our, our show here together. Uh, do we have some uh, good comments in the, the chat or some questions that have arise? One just did pop up um, just about Molly's thoughts on the millions of resignations happening lately. Do you have any thoughts you want to share on that? I mean, I think we kind of have been touching on it a little bit, but if you have any more thoughts on that, uh, we'd love to know. Yeah, well, I mean, if you're experiencing millions of resignations or um, fearful of that happening, um, my recommendation is that you immediately do a stop, drop and roll, so to speak, and start really getting connected with your employees to triage that and not from a place that I don't even love the word triage, but really it, getting that into the fabric and the bones of your business where you are consistently doing employee growth plans and you're meeting with your team, you're doing daily huddles, you're doing stand up meetings, you're doing weekly, what I call stakeholders meetings, where you are giving people time, attention and feedback, because honestly, I'm not seeing the millions of resignations. Um, I am seeing resignations, but at the end of the day, as a recruiter, the people that are talking to me, willing to talk to me and then actually leaving, it is because they are not, they're not having that connection. They're not connected to the heartbeat of the why of the mission of the values of the employees. So if that's why people are leaving. It has nothing to do with money in my experience, or that we want to, we're lazy and we want to work for home or we have entitlement mentality. And now we realize we're in the driver's seat and we want to call all the shots. I think that's for people that are saying that is they're not taking a really good look at how they are organizing and how they are operating their businesses. And it, it starts with just saying that if you have four fingers pointing, or if you have a finger pointing at somebody, there's four more pointing back at you. And it starts with, it starts with us. 
Yeah. And it's not, and it's not people leaving the workforce. Yeah, there's a lot of people resigning, but they're opting to do other things, take other positions because there's so many opportunities out there. So people, as you said earlier, they're reassessing what's important to them and what do they want and making that choice because there's so many opportunities out there right now. Yeah, and that's a great point. And we're going to see, we don't know how this is going to flush out at all, but the people that are having the entrepreneurial seizure, as Michael Gerber of the E-Myth calls it, you know, they're hanging their own shingle. Well, why am I going to go work for this guy if I can stay at home and make more money, if not the same and hang my own shingle? Well, we all know what it takes to be an entrepreneur, to hang your own shingle, to be an independent contractor. And so I'm curious to see how all this, because running a business is no joke. It's, you know, it takes a lot to be able to do that as Shard knows with multiple business as everyone does here today. So I'm really curious to see how the people that are running from versus running to, and how this is going to play out in the next, you know, two, three, five years and seeing what it's going to do for our workforce. Sam, you are me again. <laughs> I love that mute, that mute button. It's so hard to press, right? <laughs> you know, I just see this. Brain I, quicker than your hands. <laughs> no, but I, there, there's this, uh, you can hear me now though, right? Yes. Okay, so there, there's I, I just saw this product that came out. And it's just like this thing that connects to your computer, and it's a big red button that says mute on it. And you can just hit it, you know, and then it takes <laughs> you down and off. <laughs> I need to get one of those. That'd be cool. <laughs> it's but, very common, Sam. All of us yeah. do it. <laughs> but anyway, I do want to acknowledge our our sponsor today, so TMA USA, and so this is a a great tool, and uh, that that really helps have better conversations with your people. And that's what we're talking about today, right? So, so it's, a, it's a, an assessment that we can, we can give our people or candidates to the company. And it, and it tells us a little bit about their, what they're looking for in their, their career. Also their, their, their talents and their drives and so forth and how they like to interact with others in, in the workforce. So it's a, it's a great tool that, that uh, is based around positive psychology. And so there's no negativity, right? I mean, in a lot of assessments, it doesn't label you as a, as a this or a that or a, or a color or this or that color or whatever. It's more of a, a, a conversation tools and just have to have a really good uh, discovery, uh, understanding where your people want to go in the future and, and knowing their talents and, and their ambitions. So a great tool. So, uh, uh, and I know that we have uh, uh, one of the leaders of TMA on, on line two that has a question, uh, but before we get to that question, I want to uh, uh, acknowledge that we're going to have our very own Char Miller uh, speaking <laughs> next week on how to be a healthy employer. And so uh, I'm really excited to, to uh, hear that conversation and, and um, hear what you have to say on that, Char. Oh, absolutely. I'm excited to share. I've learned a lot, even in the last year. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Jules, I know that that Andre uh, Bloom from TMA has a question. Yeah. Uh, could you mention that? Yeah, sure. So I, um, yeah, if anyone has any last minute ones, because we do have a few more minutes, drop them in the chat. Now's the time, last call. Um, but Andre's question is, do you feel that this is the end of Taylorism, the control and command era? So basically, I think that the, the big thing is, is right now, especially in the US, there's, you know, kind of a, um, there's more command and control, basically a militaristic style of, of, of a hierarchy in business where, um, you know, the decisions are made from the top and they're cascaded down. Uh, but I, one thing I know and in, in, uh, uh, which really inspires me about the TMA uh, method is that in Europe, it's, it's they're more about the people, understanding, understanding the desires of the people and, and how to place them in roles that are going to make them thrive, make them be more happy, and so forth. Do you think the U.S. is, is getting more closer to that trend? What do you think, Molly? I do. I, I, um, you know, whether it's by desire or it's out of necessity, I think social media has done a beautiful job during COVID, especially of really shining the flashlight on that. 
Um, so, you know, one of my favorite books way back when is First Among Equals that I read back in the 90s, coupled with Good to Great. And I think they, you know, just going back to some of those staple books and really anchoring to them. And I do, I believe that that's where we are headed and bravo to the to the companies that are already embracing it. Well, as we, we wait for any more further questions, Molly, I'd love to hear more about how, how can people get a hold of you and, and learn more about what you do and your services that you provide? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, thank you. So the easiest way is to go to my website, uh, hiringandempowering.com, and you can opt in. Um, every Tuesday, I drop a value add blog or uh, podcast. I have a lot of great guests on there as well, talking about topics very similar to this hiring, firing, retention, communication, leadership, what have you. And um, every Thursday, I drop a blog as well. So I think that's the best way to just really engage and understand my tonality and my perspective. And uh, there's a, a contact page there as well. And be, by all means, please feel free to reach out there and send me a message. And I'd be happy to hop on a, a complimentary call with anyone that I could support in any industry. And Molly, I know you're you're currently writing a, a book. Can you tell us about the past books that you have in place and, and what the new book is all about? Yeah, so I've written a book called Don't Be a Yes Chick um, mm -hmm. that came out in 2009, was number one on Amazon bestseller list, um, really empowering employees to learn how to speak up and lead. Um, I've written a book called Entrepreneurs and Entrepreneurs World. Um, how to get your employees to step up and lead. And my last one was the 66 day law firm turnaround, how to turn around your people, your process, your production and profitability in 66 days or less. And my book right now that I'm so excited about is called fix my employees. And it's really in, in parentheses that has ER, employer. And my goal with that book is really, truly to transform the employee-employer relationship once and for all. And for that book really to be a body of work for both of them to keep off the shelf and to um, ingrain into the fabric of their business to stop the retention, to stop the resignations. Because in my experience, People really don't want to lead, leave um, in a workforce at all. It's just because of the lack of um, attention and care and communication and collaboration, um, which starts with the breakdown in the perspective from each side of the table. Mm. Uh, I love the topics of your, of your book. So I'll be checking you out, Molly. Thank you. Yeah, excited when that one comes out. So shoot us a note when it does. I mean, I, I would love to make sure that everybody knows about that. Absolutely. Well, and thank you. That, everyone's been loving it. Everyone says you keep it real. They love that, that it was a great session, really informative, that you're excellent. Uh, we couldn't agree anymore. <laughs> thank you so much. We know you're so busy writing books, making podcasts, <laughs> running business. So we love that you were able to hop on and you know inspire this uh, group today, Molly. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. <laughs> Great, Molly. So uh, wonderful conversation. It was, it was a pleasure having you. So you have a, a great week and I hope to see you soon. Thank yeah. you all. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Next week. <laughs>